Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for taking the time to join today's webinar. It is top of the hour and I want to be respectful of your time, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today we'll be talking about inherited IRAs. Um, as the adage goes, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children. So if you're a beneficiary of someone's retirement account, um, consider it an honor as they're entrusting you with their life savings. Um, so whether you you have inherited an IRA or you plan to leave one, an inherited IRA comes with responsibilities that should be handled with um, you know, absolute care and precision. Uh, there are different options available to you and certain requirements that you have to consider. So today I'm just gonna go over some of the basics like what is an inherited IRA and how it works, the different types of beneficiaries and um, the account withdrawal options for RMD uh, rules as it relates to, to inherited accounts. If you have any specific questions, uh, definitely feel free to put those in the question box and we'll get those answered for you. My name is Renika Lightborn. I'm a business development specialist here at Advanta. I've been with Advanta as an employee since 2019, um, but I'm also an Advanta client prior to joining. Uh, so self-directing is something that I actively do. Uh, after today's webinar, if you have specific questions or you want to do a deeper dive and talk through your scenario, uh, you're always welcome to give me a call or send me an email or you can visit advanceira.com to schedule a consultation. So just a, little, a quick disclaimer before we get going, uh, just know that Advanta IRA and its employees, we don't give you any tax, legal, investment advice. Uh, we also don't endorse any particular products. Uh, just know that the information that I'm gonna present today is for educational purposes. Uh, so as always, we always uh, encourage you to consult with your professional team, whether it's your CPA, attorney, or a financial advisor before you make any investments. So just a little history about Advanta and who we are. Uh, we've been in business for nearly 20 years as the leading self-directed IRA administrator in the business. Our headquarters is in Largo, Florida, which is the general Tampa Bay area. Advanta also has an office in Atlanta, which is where I'm based. But we do work with clients nationwide as we have uh, well over 2 billion under our administration. I uh, just know that if you have cash sitting in your account, whether it's an IRA account or uh, some other type of account with us, it is FDIC insured, so the cash is, is insured. And then, of course, um, our focus is providing you high-quality concierge style service. So as a client, we do have a dedicated account manager with us that's going to be with you for the life of your account. And also, too, uh, we provide you uh, great educational content on a weekly basis. Our webinars are recorded, so this will be uploaded to our, our video on demand um, on our website and also our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have um, week, uh, a bi-weekly uh, networking event. It's called Pitch Promote Prosper, so I encourage you to visit our website and, and sign up to attend. Um, my colleague Alex also has a podcast with great information. And also, too, you can check out our blog. Um, it has the latest industry news as relates to anything in the industry re uh, regarding self-directed IRAs. So before we dive into information specifically on inherited IRAs, I just want to give you a synopsis of the term self-directed IRA. And it just simply means that you as the account owner, you have complete control over your retirement funds, you have complete control over the investment decisions, uh, you get to decide what is it that you want to invest in. Um, if you've never heard of the term self-directed, it's okay, it's just simply um, most IRAs are held at the, the banks and the brokerage firms and their business model is stock, bonds, mutual funds. But you can indeed uh, self-direct your retirement account, which includes inherited IRAs. So why do people choose to self-direct? Uh, you can self-direct for many different reasons. Um, I'll just touch on a, a few of them. One, instead of taking out um, you know, a personal loan or tapping into your emergency fund, if you have funds that's sitting in a retirement account, or in this case, an inherited IRA, you can elect to move those funds over to, to make your investment. Two, the ups and downs in the stock market. Again, with the stock market, no one can you know, predict what's gonna happen. But with self-directing, you get to diversify into um, other tangible assets like real estate or precious metals. And then, of course, the tax benefits, having those rents, those profits, those dividends flow back into your retirement account, um, tax for your tax deferred, in this case with an inherited IRA, if it's you know tax deferred. And then, of course, um, or a Roth IRA, meaning after tax dollars. So now we're going to go ahead and pivot into today, today's topic, which are, um, but I want to cover some key takeaways to, um, to be mindful of as you go through the information. So just know that an inherited IRA is an account that has been opened uh, when an individual inherits a retirement plan 
after the original account owner dies. Uh, the rules differ for spousal and non-spousal beneficiaries of inherited IRAs. Uh, the SECURE Act in December 2019 mandated that certain beneficiaries must empty their inherited accounts uh, within 10 years, and we'll um, take a look at that. You cannot make any additional contributions to an inherited IRA. And also please note that um, because inherited IRAs ha does come with um, some complex rules, and this webinar is just more so to, to give you a fundamental overview, you want to consult with your, your tax attorney or a certified financial planner who's specialized specifically in estate planning um, in regards to your particular situation. And then, of course, as mentioned, you can indeed self-direct an inherited IRA, uh, which allows you to invest those funds into uh, assets like real estate, uh, private equities, precious metals, and much more. So exactly what is an inherited IRA? Again, an inherited IRA, also known as the beneficiary IRA, is a separate account that's open when someone inherits an IRA or an employer-sponsored plan after the original account owner dies. Uh, the, the individual that's inheriting the IRA um, may be anyone. It could be a spouse, it could be a relative, a non-family member, or even a, a legal entity like a, a trust or a charitable organization. Um, ultimately, the beneficiary gets to move the assets from the original account owner into a newly opened IRA in their name. A, a common question that typically comes up is uh, what to do when you inherit an IRA. Uh, while all beneficiaries uh, have the option to cash out the inheritance by taking a, a lump sum, most tax experts, when you uh, confer with them, would tell you um, this may, may not be the best strategy um, in terms of it could bump you up into a higher tax bracket and or you incur a large tax bill um, if you do decide to take a, a lump sum distribution. The rules on how to handle an inherited IRA will differ, again, based on the type of beneficiary you are, but there are a few exceptions and we'll take a look at some of those. I do know that any type of IRA, whether it's a traditional or Roth IRA, a SEP or simple IRA, along with any former employer plan like a 401k or 403b, uh, can be turned into an inherited IRA. And then, of course, the, the income tax treatment for IRAs remain the same from the original account over to the inherited IRA. So um, if the account was made with pre-tax dollars as in a traditional IRA scenario or after-tax dollars in a Roth IRA, it's still, con it's still considered or treated the same in terms once it moves over into the inher inherited IRA account. Uh, you can visit the IRS website for guidelines or on inherited IRAs and also check with your, uh, your tax, um, tax specialist for more information. Uh, the IRS forms 1099-R and 5498 are required for reporting inherited IRAs and distributions, and uh, I'll uh, cover some of that um, as we go. So now let's take a look at some special considerations to be mindful of when it comes to beneficiary IRAs. I do want to start off with uh, the 10-year rule. So under the SECURE Act of 2019, which is setting every community up for retirement enhancement, introduced that most beneficiaries will be subject to a 10-year rule. Um, the key date with this is um, determining how the 10-year rule applies um, is the account based on the account owner's um, requ required beginning date, so the RBD, required beginning date. Uh, the required beginning date for the IRA owner born on or before, um, on or after July 1st, 1949, or in this case, April 1st of the year following the account owner debt. I know that's a mouthful, but just simply uh, meaning if the account owner turns 72 in 2022, and their RBD date, which is the required beginning date for them to take a distribution, will be April 1st of 2023. So if the account owner dies between, um, before their RBD date, the 10-year rule only uh, requires that the entire account be emptied by December 31st of the 10th year. So in this case, uh, there wouldn't be any annual required minimum distributions. So let's give an example. If um, Let's just say if Jane Smith turns 72 this month and she dies anytime between now and March 31st of 2023, and she has an adult daughter um, by the name of Cindy Smith, and Cindy is her beneficiary, then Cindy would have 10 years to deplete, to deplete the count to empty out that inherited IRA. However, if the IRA owner um, dies on or after her RBD date or their RBD date, the 10-year rule does apply, and the beneficiary must also take out an annual um, distribution, take out an annual RMD. The RMDs for, in this case will be calculated based on the beneficiary's life expectancy table. So let's go back to the same example. If Jane Smith turns 72 this month and she dies 
on April 1st or later of 2023, uh, her adult daughter, Cindy, would have 10 years to de deplete the count, but Cindy must also now take out RMDs um, during that time. So she has 10 years for the RMD requirements from, based on the IRS guidelines she would have to take out um, from year one through nine. And then of course, in the 10th year, make sure the account is completely empty. So it is vital to understand and be aware of the year of death date based on distributions. Um, the reporting for any distributions to the beneficiary must fall underneath the, the name of the name and social security number of the beneficiary and not actually the deceased. Beneficiaries of traditional IRAs have to figure out if the IRA owner who passed had taken his or her RMD in the year of death. If the original account owner hasn't uh, didn't do so, then it's the responsibility of the beneficiary to make sure that the minimum has been met. So for example, um, it's unfortunate, let's just say, you know, your, your dad passed away early January, leaving, uh, leaving you his, his, his IRA. Uh, chances are he probably hadn't gotten around to taking out his distributions just yet. So for you as the beneficiary, you must take out, uh, take out the RMD. Um, another hurdle that you wanna consider is if someone dies late in the year, just know that December 31st is the deadline for taking out that year's RMD. So again, if a parent died, um, let's just say, you know, it's Christmas Day and they still hadn't taken out that distribution, for you as the account owner, you may not even know that you're, you know, you own the account or um, you're the beneficiary until after or it's already too late for you to take out a distribution for that year. And then of course, um, if the deceased was not required to take out a distribution, then of course, in that case, uh, there's no need to be concerned about um, distributions. The next thing I wanna cover is the required minimum distributions. Uh, just bear with me, checking the question box. So the next thing we're, we're gonna cover is the required minimum distributions. So individual re retirement arrangements such as traditional and set simples are subject to RMDs. Um, RMDs, the age for RMD now is now 72. It used to be 70 and a half. Um, also too, just um, keep in mind that um, under the new, under the SECURE Act 2.0, so there's a, a new um, SECURE Act are currently with Congress that, that's looking to shift RMD age from uh, in 2023 up from um, 72 to 73. And then of course in 2030, it's gonna look to bump it up to 74 and then possibly in 2033 and move it up to 75. So required minimum distributions to RMDs are just designed to ensure that investments in, in the IRA account don't, don't grow tax deferred over, um, doesn't grow tax deferred forever. Um, ultimately, it does carry over to the beneficiary. So you are required to take an RMD mm -hmm. if, if it applies. With RMDs um, that's not distributed, so the question is, can I take it all out end of the 10th year? It depends. Um, if you're a beneficiary, and we'll talk about the different types of beneficiary, but let's just say you are a non-eligible beneficiary, meaning you're a daughter or a grandchild. Um, when I say children, adult children, if, you, um, if your parent died prior to, prior to April 1st after turning 70, 72, then you won't be required to um, take out an RMD. Um, and you can you know, typically take it out as you wish. It, it'll be your discretion. That's where you want to confer with your, um, your tax person just to see if it makes sense just to take it out as a lump sum or take it out in, in one particular year. Just be mindful that if you do decide just to take it out in one year, it's gonna, it possibly could put you in a higher tax bracket. Um, if your parent, Unfortunately, or you're the beneficiary of someone who passes, you know, after their RMD date, which is April 1st, um, then of course you're required to take out their RMD, their distributions, and also deplete the account within 10, um, within 10 years. So it just really depends on the type of beneficiary you are. So RMDs must be distributed in order to avoid a penalty, which is also called the access accumulation penalty. If an individual fails to take out that RMD, uh, then they'll, they'll be subject to um, a penalty of 50% of the amount that was required to take out. As the beneficiary um, will need to pay, you'll need to pay that, that penalty using IRS Form 5329, and we'll take a look at that. You may be able to avoid that additional tax you know, if failure to take out an RMD was due to a reasonable error. So let's just say you were seriously ill 
they would then go through the process of you know taking out the necessary amount and then um, asking for a penalty waiver by submitting uh, 5329. Um, I, I do want to reference that uh, the Secure Act you know did create some confusion about RMDs uh, for those who fell within or fell under the, the 10 year rule. And just this month, um, the IRS on October 7th, I believe, um, put out a notice that gave clarity on RMDs. So uh, they did say that they were going to waive the 50% penalty for RMDs that were missed during 2021 and 2022 for beneficiaries who fell within that 10-year rule um, that was supposed to take on RMDs simply because they didn't know or there was you know, vagueness or misinterpretation of the rule. Um, the 50% tax is considered to be one of the, high, um, the heaviest penalties in the tax code. And the SECURE Act 2.0, um, which is still um, pending, which is still with Congress, is looking to reduce that penalty, that penalty down to 25% and possibly drop that penalty down to, to 10% if you take the necessary RMD um, by the, the end of the second year following the year it was due. So let's give an example. So if you fail to take RMD that was due in 2022, the penalty will come down to 10% um, if you went through that, that, that funds by December 31st of 2024. Um, again, that bill is still pending, so we have to wait for it to pass and, and legislation to be enacted with that. So another thing to consider is life expectancy payments. Um, life expectancy payments is based on the age of the eligible designated beneficiary. And again, we'll cover the different types of beneficiaries and start. Um, so it'll um, I'll just bear with me one moment. Yeah, so life expectancy payments is based on the age of, of the eligible designated beneficiary and starts on December 31st of the year following the death of the IRA holder. So if the beneficiary holder is, um, is if the beneficiary is older, I'm sorry, than the IRA holder, uh, there is an option or a possibility that the beneficiary can use the age of the person who's deceased um, year of death to further reduce their specific um, RMD requirements. And then a final consideration I do want to uh, cover is the beneficiary form itself. Um, that's it's part of the application when you're opening up a retirement account. I implore you, please uh, don't want to ignore this, this form. Um, while beneficiary forms are not required documents based on uh, the list of documents that's needed to actually establish an IRA, completing the beneficiary form, however, is is, is vital as it ensures that the IRA holder um, rifle is received the retirement assets based on. Um, assets upon their death. Um, IRAs are considered valid trusts under state law. So by law, if there's a named beneficiary under that trust, the asset automatically flows through to that named beneficiary. If it's unclear, incomplete, or missing designated beneficiary form, um, that can significantly impact your estate planning process. That one page form uh, with just a few key, key pieces of information can literally control and dictate large sums of money. So you do want to you know, make sure that it's complete, it's accurate. You don't want to procrastinate. You want to make sure that it's filled out correctly. Uh, you can make changes to it at any time. Uh, you may also decide to periodically check on your beneficiary form, meaning you know, whether it's on an annual basis or every couple of years. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing beneficiary forms is because with beneficiaries, this avoids the probate, probate um, process. Um, if there's no beneficiaries listed on the form, the account then goes to your estate, which will then go through the probate court system. And we know the process uh, for probate can be you know, pretty lengthy and expensive. And then of course, they're using this to resolve claims, um, you know, such as creditors and also distributions of any property that the, the account owner may have hold. Uh, the naming convention for beneficiary um, I'm sorry, naming a beneficiary under an IRA allows you again to avoid the probate court system. It allows administrators and custodians like Advanta to appropriately be able to distribute IRA assets directly to, to your heirs. Um, special note that I do wanna mention that. Okay, so the question is, if it's a Roth, there should be no taxes. So it depends. If it's a Roth IRA, you can, act, um, you can take out the, the contributions um, without any tax implication. Um, the earnings, however, depends on how long that account has been open. So if, you're, if the Roth account has been open for five years, then you can take out those earnings without any tax implications. If the Roth account that you inherit was you know, open for five years or less, you know, not yet five years, then um, you'll be subject to uh, to taxes on those earnings. So the question is, dad dies, I inherit Roth IRA, I have 10 years to take it out. Um, essentially, yes. Um, if you, you know, in this case, you would, you would fall under the, the, 
most likely fall into the guidelines of non-eligible designated beneficiary, which would then put you in that 10-year um, bracket. So going back to the beneficiary forms really quickly, I just want to uh, mention that, you know, that conflicts or disputes may occur if the actual, um, if there's multiple beneficiaries and there's, um, you know, misinterpretation on that beneficiary form, if, that it's, if it's not clear, in that case, it would be best to, um, you know, involve your legal counsel just to, you know, sort through that situation before you start taking any distributions on how, on, on how you should. Um, next question, bear with me one second. Okay, all right. So that's more so a comment. So yes, if um, if there's any disputes relating to a beneficiary form, that's where you, you do want to uh, loop in your, your legal counsel to sort through that. Uh, the beneficiary information that administrators uh, like Advanta and um, custodians like Advanta would need, you know, we, we do have an important um, an important role in terms of making sure that we we acquire enough information to help identify and contact beneficiaries that are named. So social security numbers of the beneficiaries are you know essential because this ensure that we you know we're satisfying the reporting um, requirements necessary by law on the back end. Also, too. Um, we would need information such as, you know, email addresses, phone numbers, or addresses just to kind of help with, with locating, and then further information to help determine, you know, beneficiary options would be the date of the um, the date of birth of the beneficiary and also the relationship that they have with the IRA holder. And then when it comes to naming a trust as a beneficiary, um, it may involve requiring that acquiring that the trustee or other contact information of the trust. So whether it's a trust certification um, from that state, if it's qualified trust, you may also need um, other necessary information from the oldest uh, trust beneficiary based on their based on their age. And then of course, when it's um, relating to, let's just say it's a charitable institution like a nonprofit, naming a charitable organization also follows the same guidelines in terms of you have to acquire contact information or uh, from a representative of that organization, the tax identification number um, to be able to help with, with reporting on the back end. Okay, so now I want to talk through the actual beneficiary designations. Um, the rules for inherited IRAs again depend on the type of beneficiary you are and the year that you inherit the original IRA. So under the SECURE Act, there are actually three kinds of in, uh, retirement plan beneficiaries. Um, there are eligible designated beneficiaries, there are non-eligible designated beneficiaries, and there are non-designated beneficiaries. I know that can be confusing, but I will try to go through it and simplify it as, as much as possible. So there are five classes of eligible designated beneficiary. There is a surviving spouse, a minor child, a disabled person, a disabled person is someone who is unable to engage in, you know, gainful activity because of any medical, physical, or mental impairment. Um, someone who's considered chronically ill is also eligible designated beneficiary, and um, that would be an individual who who has been certified by a licensed health or care um, healthcare practitioner. And then finally, an eligible designated beneficiary is also an individual who's not more than 10 years younger than the account owner, such as a sibling or life partner. So, for example, if the, uh, the original IRA owner, Bob, was 80 years old when he passed and his sister, Susan, is 75 um, as his beneficiary. Uh, some trusts are also considered eligible designated beneficiary. If a trust is set up to benefit someone who's an eligible designated beneficiary as a result of being, you know, you know disabled or chronically ill, the trust itself can be considered an eligible designated beneficiary. So before January 1st of 2020, all beneficiaries had the option to stretch the annual distributions um, from the inherited IRAs throughout their lifetime. But again, with the passage of the SECURE Act, it eliminated that lifetime stretch for uh, most beneficiaries who inherit their account on January 1st, 2020 and after. Um, eligible designated beneficiaries, however, uh, still have the option to stretch it over their lifetime. Um, all of the beneficiaries who inherited an account prior to the SECURE Act uh, still have that, that ability to stretch out. Um, I do want to kind of reference a special rule as it relates to minor children. So minor children who inherited an IRA in 2020 and later, uh, they must take RMDs from that inherited plan until they turn the age of 21. Uh, the, uh, the IRS actually also just clarified the age of maturity um, as 21, regardless of state law. So some states is 18, other states is 21, but um, just recently the IRS said that they consider um, adult as age 21. 
at which time once the person, um, the minor child turns 21, that's when their 10 clock, um, 10 year clock starts for them to be able to deplete, um, deplete, deplete the account. So let's give an example. If Steve is 45 years old and he has um, an IRA and he also has a minor son, if Steve you know, died in an accident leaving his IRA to his son, uh, the son will take out regular lifetime RMDs until he reaches the age of 21. And then once he turns 21, uh, the 10 year rule applies. So he'll have 10 years to actually um, empty that account. If a minor child inherits the, the account before 2020, uh, they can continue to stretch that IRA distribution throughout their lifetime. So that was, you know, a big change with, um, with the SECURE Act, you know, whether you inherited an account before 2020 or after 2020. Um, just see, just bear with me one second. So it says if the owner, if the owner is younger than the beneficiary, wait, just bear with me one second. If the owner is younger than the beneficiary, uh, then the beneficiary would be an, an eligible uh, designated beneficiary. So the example I was given is if it's, you know, within 10 years. So let's just say, um, the IRA owner is, you know, not older than 10 years and the person that they're leaving the account to, then that person is considered an eligible ben beneficiary. And in this question here, um, it depends if, you know, that person is older and they're chronically ill, then what they would be considered um, an eligible, de de eligible designated beneficiary. Um, if they're disabled, they would also be considered. So it just really depends on on that person's specific situation. So eligible designated beneficiaries, um, distributions are calculated based on the single life expectancy table. Um, and of course, this is based on their age and the year after the IRA owner, um, the IRA owner staff, uh, the factor for that also is reduced by one year um, for each subsequent dis distribution year. And we'll take a look at, at the actual life expectancy table. Uh, let me see, just bear with me one moment. So the question is, for, um, if the owner is 25 and the beneficiary is 45 and the owner dies, uh, the beneficiary is an EBD. So it depends on that 45 year old, um, you know, are they the spouse? Are they, you know, like, who are they to that person? I mean, if it's just, if it's unrelated and they don't fall within that eligibility, um, then no, they would be, they would can be considered a non-eligible person. So not more than 10 years younger. So in this case, it's more than 10 years um, older. Okay, so um, we'll circle back, just bear with me one moment. Okay, so this is actually the, um, yes, feel free to do so. Okay, so this is the actual uh, life expectancy table and it'd be based on the, the beneficiary's age. And then of course it, it bumps down, um, or it's reduced one year by one year each um, each year they, they take a distribution. So now looking at non-eligible designated beneficiaries and also um, designated beneficiaries. So non-eligible designated beneficiaries um, are pretty much anyone that doesn't qualify as eligible designated beneficiary, meaning they're not a spouse, um, they're not chronically ill, they're not, um, you know, they don't have a disability and they're not, um, 10 years younger, well, they're more than 10 years um, younger. And in this case, for non-eligible designated beneficiaries, this include adult children, grandchildren, it can be someone that's related or unrelated, or also some um, look-through trusts. The key thing to with this is to remember that if the owner dies um, before their required beginning date, which is April 1st, after they turn 72, uh, there won't be any um, annual RMDs for that 10 year window. However, if the owner dies on or after their required um, beginning distribution date, then they do have to, um, the beneficiary would have to take RMDs within that first um, year one through nine and also deplete that account within 10 years. So for non-designated beneficiaries, um, these are, um, you know, anyone, these are not individuals, more so they're not people, they're more so entities such as um, a non-qualifying trust, an estate or a charitable organization. Um, do know that the rules for estates and charities do differ from the rules for, for individual beneficiaries. 
So while we're talking on trust, I do want to reference that um, a qualified trust, in order to be considered a qualified trust, you must satisfy you know, certain criteria, meaning it has to be a valid trust under state law. It, it must be irrevocable upon death. Um, it must be, must identify um, beneficiaries. And then of course, Advanta as the custodian, as the administrator will need a copy of the trust certification forms. Um, and you have to provide those no later than October 31st of the year following year of death. For charitable organizations, which are, you know, commonly Name as individual um, named by individuals who have larger estates. The estate that's paid to you know a, a nonprofit or a charitable organization uh, for for those individuals that could be subject to estate taxes. And in that scenario, again, you want to you know make sure that you're consulting with a tax um, a tax attorney or estate planning professional to kind of help navigate that um, navigating inherited IRAs when when trusts or estates are involved. I'm just checking the chat box. Just bear with me one moment. I'll say to, to um, you know, I, I know that's a mouthful, but to keep it simple so, uh, for this webinar, we're going to um, kind of hone in on spouse and non-spouse beneficiary options after 2020, um, after January 1st, 2020. So for spouses, they get the most leeway. They have the greatest flexibility as the inherited rules for spouses didn't change much with the passage of the SECURE Act a spouse can elect to uh, put the deceased IRA in their own name or roll the money over it into their existing IRA. If they do take, uh, take it as their own, they can make annual contributions. Whereas if it's just an inherited IRA, you can no longer make contributions to that account. In this scenario, they're taking the account as their own, so they have the option to, to make contributions. Um, spouse can also take the first ones at 59 and a half, but if they decide not to um, and take out and then they have a traditional IRA, once they reach, um, you know, once they turn 72, in this case, it's the, the RMD age, um, they do have to start taking out those, um, those distributions. If the spouse is treating the account as their own and they begin taking distributions before they reach age 59 and a half, then they will incur the 10% early withdrawal penalty. penalty. Um, just know that if the original account owner was taking RMDs but did not take one uh, the year that they died, then the spouse must take the RMD for that year. That distribution is also penalty free. Um, another option for, for spouses is to set up an inherited IRA. If the, the spouse instead decides to, to set up a new inherited IRA, they will take the same distribution um, as the deceased did, or they can also um, they can recalculate the amount based on their own life expectancy. Um, if the spouse does open up an inherited IRA, uh, the spouse um, is required to take the appropriate take the appropriate distribution every year, um, but they're not liable for that 10% early withdrawal penalty under this option. And then of course, um, if the spouse, you know, they can also take a lump sum distribution. Uh, you have complete autonomy based on your current financial situation, but most advisors would tell you or recommend that you not take a lump sum if you don't need to. Um, if you decide to, to go this route, then, you know, if it's a traditional IRA, you will have to pay income taxes on those distribution. Um, but the early withdrawal penalty is waived in, in that specific um, lump sum scenario. If the spouse, however, inherits a Roth IRA, uh, note that with Roth IRAs, again, if you take a, a tax-free, you can take tax-free distributions of the actual contribution, meaning the money that's, that, that was put into the account annually um, at any time. If the account has been um, established for five years or more, then again, those distributions of earnings are completely tax-free. If the account was not, if the Roth account is not five years, um, five years or older, then of course that's when it's going to be subject to those income taxes on earnings. Okay, so now with non-spouse beneficiaries, again, for most, uh, for most other individuals, you can transfer. Um, for for most other beneficiaries, they'll be considered non-spouse um, or, in this case, um, non-eligible beneficiaries. You can transfer the assets into your inherited IRA. Um, in your name and take distributions over the 10 years. Uh, the key point is uh, that may or may not be RMD each year, depending on you know when the original account owner died. And but the focus is the beneficiary must liquidate that account within 10 years. So now uh, taking a look at some of the key reporting for beneficiary IRAs, specifically uh, distribution reporting. Uh, just know that custodians are required to report uh, to the IRS any distribution taken from the IRA. Uh, distributions. Uh, to the beneficiary of an IRA is reported under their name, um, under the name of the beneficiary, I'm sorry, and the name and, and, and not the name of the deceased um, on IRS form 1099R. 
So if the beneficiary is an entity, then it's going to be reported under the EIN number, um, like in a case in the case of a charitable organization. Uh, this is also the case if distribution is just to satisfy RMD for, for the deceased. Uh, this is an image of the actual 1099R. So just know that uh, the payer in this case is the deceased as the original owner. Uh, the distribution is made to the beneficiary as the recipient. And then IRS code on box seven for, for the 1099 shows the type of distributions from the IRA. So if it's a traditional IRA, it's going to be coded um, or noted um, code four. And this is just letting you know that it's an inherited retirement account, indicating that the distributions are tax deferred. Um, and you're also exempt from any early uh, distribution penalty. Whereas if it's a Roth account, uh, it's either going to be coded as T or Q. If it's uh, marked as Q, this just means that the holding period, uh, the holding period of five years um, for qualified distributions and earnings have been met and there's no um, taxable, um, it's not taxable. Whereas if it's coded as T, this lets the IRS know that uh, the account um, holding was not met, meaning the five year time frame that you have to wait. Um, so the distributions, while it won't you know, be subject to an early um, penalty, uh, it won't be exempt, I'm sorry, from, um, from penalty because the five year period hasn't met. So you, you just wanna remember or keep it, be mindful that if it's not five years, you're, the earnings are subject to taxes. If it's more than five years, then um, you know, contributions and earnings are, are tax free. Okay, so the other relevant um, inherited, uh, the other relevant reporting when it comes to inherited IRAs are um, IRS Form 5498. Again, custodians have reporting requirements that um, associated with accounts that should be reported uh, for the deceased and the beneficiary of um, if there's any remaining assets in that account. In the year the IRA participant dies, the custodian uh, generally has to file 54, um, 5498 and provide an annual statement for the deceased and also um, for each or any non-spouse beneficiary. Uh, this is just more so to help identify the source of each IRA for the purpose of figuring out um, taxation and distributions from the IRA. If the deceased name, uh, the deceased name in this case must be shown on the, the beneficiary form 5498 and the, the annual statement. The naming convention or titling um, for these accounts is important simply because it helps, um, because it, it, it more so um, helps identify you know, that this is an account, an inherited account, it's a, it's a retirement account. So for example, it would be, let's just say, Ann Jones, beneficiary of Cindy Jones, or something very similar to that. And just, again, it just signifies that uh, the IRA was once owned by, in this case, Cindy Jones. Uh, for a spouse beneficiary, unless the spouse makes um, the IRA his or her own, the custodian treats the spouse as a non-spouse beneficiary in, in, in this reporting purposes. I know this is, doesn't apply, um, this is more so in the back end, but I just wanted to at least you know, let you know the importance of um, the IRS reporting. If the spouse in this case um, makes the IRA his or her own, then the, the custodian um, doesn't report the beneficiary designation form on 5498. Um, it's a lot more on the back end again, but we do have to um, we do have to notify uh, once once we're notified that you know an IRA holder has died, you know, via death certificate, uh, we must follow the the standard procedure when it comes to um, reporting. And then the, the final um, form I want to reference is the, the 5329 form, and this is the, the actual um, document or form you'll file if there is an access accumulation penalty, meaning you didn't take out RMD or um, you didn't take out enough RMD or you're asking for um, a waiver or special exception, then this is the, the form that you would want to file. And then, of course, um, you know, moving right along, the account opening process with us is pretty straightforward. It does require proof of you know, some important documents. So we have to, um, if you inherited a retirement account or you're re and you're ready to open up, ready to open up your account with us, um, advance, we do need you to obviously complete the application. We'll be able to walk you through that. You can do it you know, directly on our website or we'll send you, uh, send you the application link directly. Uh, you do have to list the date of death, um, provide a copy of a death certificate along with any relevant paperwork um, verifying that you are the beneficiary. And then, of course, once the account is open, the titling again of the account will include both your name as the beneficiary and the deceased um, name as the original account owner. Okay, let me just check the little, just bear with me one second. Okay, um, I can answer that one, just bear with me. 
Okay, so um, just to kind of uh, recap, um, I, again, I know it's a lot of information. It can be very complex when it comes to inherited IRAs. But this was just more so, you know, some of the basics in terms of how inherited IRA work works, meaning if you are a spouse, um, you know, you have more flexible options. If you are a minor child or, you know, someone that's considered disabled or chronically ill, you have a different set of choices. If you are um, any other type of beneficiary, you have another set of rules that you have to follow. Also, you have to um, be mindful of whether the original account owner had taking um, had take taken their RMD distributions um, can also impact what you can or should do. And then, of course, um, there's other questions like should you try to to minimize any taxes or maximize um, your cash distribution from the account. Again, most financial advisors would recommend that you hold off um, and do nothing until you confer with them or so you know all of your options. Um, if you are named a beneficiary of an IRA or an employer-sponsored plan, you want to make sure that you do, um, you know, connect with your financial planner uh, just to make sure that you understand the the IRA, the inherited IRA rules that works best for you in your situation. Uh, let me go to some questions. Just bear with me. So the question is: Did you say that the beneficiary designation needs to be done by October 31st, the year after death? Um, are you referring to uh, thank you. Are you referring to um, trust or? Yeah, so uh, the question is um, the, the October 31st date that I was referencing for non designated beneficiaries, or in this case, um, for, for qualified trusts, you have to provide it uh, no later than October 31st, the year following the, the account, um, the original account owner does. So that's the date I was re referencing. Yeah, referencing. Okay, so this recording, um, if there's no more questions, I just know that this recording will be up in 24 to 48 hours. Also, too, if you need um, you need a copy of the slide, definitely feel free to reach out to me or if you have specific questions or something I need to clarify, um, definitely feel free to reach out to me. You can give me a call or um, send me an email. I'm just trying to see if that's another question that came in. Just bear with me one moment. Okay, if there's no more questions, I appreciate everyone taking the time to um, listen in on today's webinar. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Visit advanceira.com. Thank you, everyone.